all the tech giants in China, like Tencent, ByteDance, Baidu, were all pouring a huge amount of money into AI. And I've actually talked to a few people who work in these companies leading AI teams, and then they shared that the launch of Llama accelerated the development of AI but not by so much, which was a surprise for me. In China, people are feeling this competition from the US. Open source or closed source models might be restricted just like GPUs these days. So Chinese founders naturally would need an alternative to the US system. I feel like there are a little bit too many brands of electric vehicles in China, as opposed to like in the California, you pretty much only see Teslas. Building an electric vehicle feels like they're just building a wrapper around batteries. Eventually, I think a lot of them would die, which means that a lot of resources is going to be wasted. But they are actively thinking about how do they sell overseas? How do they sell globally? There's always a trade-off between massively manufactured goods being a little bit cheaper, but then it's changing the world with uh, the new technology versus some of the traditional companies who are trying to protect their own markets and um, they use tariffs as weapon or as a defense system to protect themselves but how many years can you buy for yourselves right hey everyone so i want to talk about my experience of traveling in china in the past two weeks i'll be mainly focusing on entrepreneurship and technology because i've been talking to quite a few different founders as well as people who work in technology in mainland china and then there are a few things that i think are worth sharing on youtube the first thing is about ai the majority of the founders or investors that I met were working in or looking into the direction of AI. You know, ever since the Llama was launched, everybody else could fine tune a model fairly easily. So Chinese founders definitely know uh, where to look at and what to build upon. So uh, definitely there are a ton of large language models being built ever since Llama was becoming better and better. And uh, uh, surrounding that, you know, like there, there are a lot of very famous startups these days and all the tech giants in China, like Tencent, ByteDance, uh, Alibaba, Baidu, were all pouring a huge amount of money into, into AI. And I've actually talked to a few people who work in these companies who are leading AI teams. And then they shared that um, the launch of Llama accelerated the development of AI but not by so much, which was a surprise for me because people say that it was still doable for people to create some sort of AI, but then um, it might take still a another few months and then people start focusing on you know, how to train a model based on the data in China, based on the use cases in China. So that definitely was uh, a game changer for, for the founders here. And, um, and that brings me to the second point, which is that the competition is immensely huge than you would ever imagine because as we all know, like the Chinese economy is, is sort of slowing down these days and pe young people these days, it's not easy to find a job. And just like in the US actually uh, for tech, it's, uh, it's very difficult to, to look for a junior level job, but you know, uh, similar things are happening in, within founders because um, it's, it's hard to grow the market uh, as fast as before and people are having less willingness to pay. So uh, what I realized is that the, most of the founders that I talk to are at least thinking about expanding globally. So these days, I think, I feel like that the startups in China are not really domestic focused anymore. Like people start to think about global uh, expansion from day one because the environment doesn't allow them to purely focus in the domestic market even if like it's a 1.4 billion people market but but because of the economic downturn because of um you know the competition between china and the us for ai technology so pretty much all of them are thinking about hey how do i build an ai application not just for china but also for the rest of the world and chinese founders know that facing the us market could be a challenge because of all the political reasons and all sorts of things so people start to look into you know Southeast Asia, Europe, uh, the Middle East. That's just been a trend in, in this country. US is a pioneer in a lot of things and uh, a huge market for the majority of the countries in the world, but uh, not necessarily a huge market welcoming uh, Chinese companies these days. So people are thinking about, hey, what are my alternatives? And the alternatives are pretty much the rest of the world, which is a big enough market, but you know, uh, uh, the willingness to pay per capita might not be as high as the U.S., but still doable. So uh, you definitely see a lot of people thinking, how do you, how do you build uh, overseas? How do you build products that can serve the global market? I think that is a very big change compared to the mobile age when uh, everybody was building applications for, for example, you know, ordering delivery for food, or hailing a taxi, things like that, which is very domestic market focused. And thirdly, I realized that for AI, research has become way more important than ever before in terms of entrepreneurship because a lot of the startups who got funding are people with a lot of research capabilities 
you know, in history, you might have heard that PhDs are not encouraged to become a CEO of a company because people think that, hey, you spend a very long time focusing on a very specific problem. Building a company, building a product is more about understanding the, the market, understanding the people who are using the product. So PhDs might not be necessarily having, you know, the spectrum of the skill set for the sort of market oriented things. But these days, because the competition of AI technology is still at a very early, early stage, even if we have already seen, you know, Claude and GPT-40 being so powerful. And then these days that Sam Altman is talking about this strawberry project. But most people still think that we are at an early stage. So researchers got rewarded for focusing on research or at least half of the time on the market, on the users and half of the time on the research, because a lot of the fundamental frameworks are not perfect yet. People are criticizing about lane chain, people are criticizing about, you know, how you build agents, how you build graphs, but there are problems of uh, efficiency, there are problems of uh, reasoning, there are problems of how do you, you know, make sure that agents are exchanging information at a reasonable level. So I definitely have seen a lot of people investing and researching and building products for fundamental frameworks for AI. And it's still been a trend. And I think this trend will last for even longer in China because people are feeling this competition from the US about, you know, potentially that open source models or closed source models might be restricted just like GPUs these days. So Chinese founders naturally would need an alternative to the US system. Just like, you know, we had Baidu versus Google, we had um, uh, all sorts of maps versus Google Maps, and we had Didi uh, as opposed to Uber, and now there should be Chinese LLMs versus the US LLMs or European LLMs or anywhere else. So the opportunities of building alternatives still exist these days. So yeah, that's that's some of my observations about AI in China. I want to quickly talk about electric vehicles as well, because that's one of the biggest um, industries these days, the most popular industries these days in China for in terms of innovation, in terms of green energy, in terms of uh, selling manufactured goods with even higher values added. A few things I realized. First thing is that I feel like there are a little bit too many brands of electric vehicles in China, as opposed to like in the California, you pretty much only see Teslas. And sometimes you see Kia or sometimes you see BMW uh, electric vehicles, but you rarely see, you know, in China, you could you could you could see like, I don't know, 20 different types of models on the road by all sorts of different companies and they are expanding globally. I think this competition is good in the early days because that helps the individual consumers to have enough choices and the price is pretty low. You could say that there's some subsidies, but I think the market has played a very important role here because if you ha imagine the US, if you have 20 different Teslas out there and maybe there are like a top five or six of them, but then the rest of them, you know, are going to die eventually. But still, if you have top five or six Teslas alternatives in the US, can you imagine how low the price could potentially be? Because the demand is just there. It's just this much, right? Um, and also you have seen that Tesla's sales was slowing down in the past you know, few months and uh, their stock price plummeted for a little bit. It's unimaginable what's happening in China because building an electric vehicle feels like they're just building a wrapper around batteries, around these car manufacturing products. So I think this low price for cars and this abundance in choices for electric vehicles is amazing and a little bit concerning because eventually I think a lot of them would die, which means that a lot of resources is going to be wasted. But they are actively thinking about how do they sell overseas? How do they sell globally? And it's very important for cars these days to have an international plan. And I think they're expanding to Thailand, expanding to Australia, the UK, uh, European Union. Um, they cannot enter the US market and these days EUs are trying to put you know tariffs on Chinese imported cars but this trend is ongoing because you could see that domestically this abundance of choices is going crazy so yeah I have no hard feelings but I think this is a fact that is worth sharing to the rest of the world and people should realize that hey um, electric vehicle era is coming with or without tariffs in any country I think regulation is important but there's always a trade-off between massively manufactured goods being a little bit cheaper but then it's changing the world with uh, the new technology versus some of the traditional companies who are trying to protect their own markets and um, they use 
tariffs as weapon or as a defense system to protect themselves but how many years can you buy for yourselves right so for any company who are working in clean energy working in electric vehicles i think it's it's about it's it's the right time to to feel a little bit unsafe and and need to innovate right and one interesting fact is that pretty much most of the cities you just saw electric vehicle taxis in china because it's very cheap because uh, charging is very cheap as well and uh, um and also it, it fits into the this green energy sort of grand goal. Uh, I mean, it's not complete green energy, but it's still uh, better than just using gas, right? Yeah, so this is uh, some of my current thoughts about traveling in China. And if I have more thoughts, I'll follow up with other videos. Hope this is interesting or helpful and leave a comment down below if you have any questions. Cheers.